Hi, Misha here, and let me tell you about my weekend. It sucked. We were ready to go to the range. I was all packed up, looking forward to trying out that Hellion bullpup, as few as a couple other things. The weather was gorgeous, one of those rare weekends we get in Arkansas. Sunny, warm, but not hot, not muddy. Absolutely perfect. And then I got sick. And typically I can knock out a cold or a flu in a couple of days. And since I started to get sick on Wednesday of last week, I wasn't too concerned. In fact, I was feeling better Saturday. But Sunday morning, woke up and absolutely couldn't go. In fact, I waited, tried to take a shower, drink some coffee do whatever I could to feel better, but eventually I just I had to call and say, look, got to cancel. And it was a terrible day. I felt bad, and I got absolutely no work done. So, range trip is postponed, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's been cloudy and rainy and nasty here. Hopefully it will clear up soon. That preamble is to explain why I'm doing this video. This is another one of my kind of big trek videos, long, but I will try to put uh, tabs in. It's something I've wanted to be talking about. Anyway, revisiting one of my favorite guns, the Russian Makarov, and other non 18 variants. Now there's really nothing new on the table, same 10 guns I've had for a while now, the Chinese is probably the newest that I picked up a couple of years ago from a friend. But th in this video, I want to talk about why I like the macro so much, shooting it, disassembly, maintenance, and just kind of share all the little tidbits I've learned being an owner for over 20 years and kind of with a little bit of an obsessive personality for details and minutiae. So we'll talk about the original Russian manufacturer, the three other licensed manufacturers, and we'll talk about guns from Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia that were also chambered for the 9 by 18 cartridge. Basically, I feel bad for not getting work done and I'm still recovering, so in this video I'm going to my happy place to feel better, talking about Makarovs. Oh, and also I combed through various sh old shooting archives to find shooting clips of uh, most of these. So when we talk about how they shoot, you'll get some uh, on-screen evidence. With that, let's get into it. Before we get going, just a little reminder. If you could, please do like, share, and subscribe, especially on these longer videos. The liking really helps. I understand if it takes you a few days to get through them. And again, I'll try to put in a, a table of contents in the description to help out a bit. But I'm sick at home, so what can you do? And if you'd like to help support the channel a bit more as we move into shooting season, uh, check out the link to the Patreon page, why not? I'm going to try to make this my definitive Makarov video. I've included things that I've forgotten in previous videos and tried to share the most up-to-date information I've got. Of course, it will be a little generalized because if, I told, if we went into details about everything, we'd be here about two days. But with that, yeah, let's get into it. Type 54, Tucker Red. <laughs> During World War II, the Great Patriotic War, these were the two standard military sidearms. The somewhat newly adopted Tokarev TT-33, firing 7.62 by 25, and the still in production 1895 Nagant revolver, firing 7.62 Nagant, which was an interesting revolver cartridge, to say the least. The P-51 
pistols were durable enough and relatively cheap to produce. But they really showed Russia what it would want going into the post-war era. Also, going into the post-war era, we have a lot of new guns. The SKS is coming around. The AK is a not far off. And World War II proved more than ever that submachine guns like the PPSH and the PPS were very effective. This kind of changed the mindset of what a handgun, a pistol, a sidearm was for in a the military. They decided that for most close quarter type work, a submachine gun, later to be an assault rifle, was adequate. It was light enough, short enough. And of course, later on, guns like the AKSU, the Krenkov, would be developed to really take this to a new level. So what's the point of a handgun? Well, very close defensive use only. So the new handgun should be compact, easy to carry, kind of a daily carry thing. You don't need, you barely know what's there. Small enough, yeah. Light enough. Also, it needs to be as powerful as possible, but it also needs to be simple because they were planning on producing these in large numbers. So simplicity has a lot of advantages in production and resources and also training your soldiers to use them and keeping them well maintained. They also were concerned with ergonomics and safety because the two things these guns are not is terribly ergonomic or safe. The revolver, well, pretty stiff trigger, no manual safety as you found on most revolvers. The Tokarev, single action only, kind of a blocky grip, and uh, as famously known, the only safety was our half cock here. Another problem that they experienced, and this was kind of why the SKS had a, a fixed magazine too, the Browning style mag release on the Tokarev was felt to make it a little too easy to drop mags. So they wanted something with a better way of retaining magazines. And they wanted something with a safety, better safety record, better ergonomics, something built for mass production. They also wanted something that was more accurate at close range. Not so much long range, but close range. And uh, I have to wonder if overpenetration wasn't a concern too, because anyone who shot a Tokarev knows how this cartridge can do and what it'll go through. At the same time, even though it's powerful, it's actually quite small because uh, if it's a 30 caliber bullet. So initially, beginning in December of 1945, trials were set out to select possibly two new service guns to replace these two. One for a larger caliber, like 9mm, possibly to be a locked breech, and a smaller caliber, 7.62, kind of more of an officer's carry gun, like a lot of the 32s that were popular throughout Europe. But this was quickly dropped because a Russian inventor named Simonin would create the 9 by 18 cartridge, specifically 9.2mm by 18. This cartridge was based on German work from World War II, known as the 9mm Ultra, which later Germany would actually develop in the 9mm Police. And the whole idea behind this round, it was felt to be as powerful as you could put a cartridge in a straight, direct blowback gun. And being a blowback gun really, really solved a lot of problems. It made manufacturing much easier. It made maintenance, field stripping, faster and easier. It made it easier to train troops on. And it definitely gave it that reliability, durability that Russia really wanted. So quite quickly after the trials were announced, the idea of adopting two guns was dropped. The whole 30 caliber idea was dropped. And it was said, OK, we're going to use the 9 by 18 cartridge. But now what gun to use in it? Well, over. Half a dozen designers submitted well over a dozen design proposals throughout 1946 and 1947. In 1948, though, that's when Pamit Upstart's design, Nikolai Makarov, 
came into the forefront and his gun was really leading the charge. And as is famously known, the Makarov pistol was very much based on the German Walther PPK. And this was a very popular pistol. In fact, many, many others copied it to a greater or lesser extent after the war. Keep in mind, this was the first successful double single action gun, and it was designed for police use early on, so it wasn't a toy. Now, the PPK was designed for 32 caliber, 7.65. Yes, I know there's plenty of 9mm Kurs, 380, but those don't work as well, frankly. It has interesting wraparound grips, and of course, is typical German quality. So, Makarov took German quality and combined it with Russian quality, for better or worse. He greatly reduced the number of parts. The Walther has about 45 parts in total, many of them finely machined. He reduced his down. Eventually, it would be originally around 30 parts. They would actually reduce this further to 27. And they were managed to do this by having a lot of parts do double duty. And even though in the beginning, most all the parts were milled, machined steel, it was somewhat simplified machining processes. Notice how the wraparound grips are held on with one single screw, one piece versus on the Walther. Just little things like that. But it met all the needs of what they were wanting. It did have a safety, safety decocker actually. So much safer. The reason they went to the European, as we call it, heel mag release versus the push button on the Walther and Tokarev was to try to have better magazine retention. In fact, these are absolutely not drop free mags. You have to kind of pry them out. It had the same kind of basic disassembly as the Walther by pulling down the trigger guard. Simple blowback gun, firing the 9x18. As is famously known, this cartridge is in between 380 and 9mm. In terms of uh, foot pounds, uh, muzzle velocity, it really is almost right in the middle. A little over a thousand, depending on the loading. A 93 grain bullet in Russia, usually 95 grain, and in the USA loading. But around a thousand. It seems like the US loadings are a little lighter than the Russian military loads. But that is a much smaller bullet than, say, 9mm Parabellum, which is at least a 115 grain, usually a 124 grain, or even more. So 9mm still has more punch and a larger bullet, but this definitely has more than 380, and again, a larger bullet. So yeah, this is again a 9.2mm, so it's actually a little bit fatter. And this was designed for use around 25 meters or less with a maximum range of about 50 meters, which is why it has pretty basic sights. The front's fixed, the rear is dovetailed, they're very small. It does have a last round hold open with manually released device, unlike the Walther. It just did very well on trials. By April of 1948, it was really becoming the clear uh, leader. It had far fewer stoppages or other reliability, durability problems than its competition. It just worked. It was so damn simple. Therefore, in 1949, it was selected for further refinement and eventual adoption. And the Russian government would establish a production line at Ishesk which um, in some ways still makes them to this very day. But in this year, 1949, production was still very limited. And that would continue throughout 1950 and into 51 because they are refining the design. The prototypes from 48, 49 are a little different from what we see later on. They corrected a few issues, did a few things, yada, yada. But finally, in December of 1951, it was officially adopted into the Red Army as the pistol. Makarovo, and a couple of years later, 1953, 
it was ramped up for true full-scale production. Although since this was considered a defensive gun, a peacetime gun, and with the, the AK and other heavier weapons kind of taking priority, they would build these as they could. So it would take a while before they would get in everyone's hands, but it would happen by the 60s. And of course we would get, uh, we would get production and use in other nations as well. So the Walther was definitely an inspiration, but in a lot of ways, the Makarov is an improvement. It's not as elegant, but it is more dependable and a harder hitting gun. But of course, is it better than say like a 1911 or a Beretta or anything like that? Well, that's, that's up for debate. This is the part that's hard to do when I'm doing these videos by myself, but I shall do my best. As you know, this is a pretty traditional, although simplified, double single action pistol. It has, of course, that Walther style safety in its reverse with down being fire, up being decocked and safe. When the safety's on, everything's locked up. Soldiers are either trained to carry it empty like this and just whack the slide to load it, or to have it loaded and safety on. They were never encouraged to carry it loaded with safety off, even though this uh, trigger is relatively heavy. Not, not the worst, frankly, but yeah. This does have a floating firing pin, which is fine, but it is part of it. It doesn't have a firing pin block or anything. As you saw, of course, it has a last round hold open device with external control, magazine here, eight rounds. These uh, kind of slide side views are actually kind of inspired by the Beretta pistol series, like the Beretta 34, 35. Not really adjustable sights aside from the drift, lanyard loop. Very basic, frankly, and so is disassembly. Pull down the trigger, guard, I just like to kick it over to the side, hold it down, pull your frame, let it go back up. Take your spring off if you want. This one's stiff, I might want to fight it. There's no reason to. But that's, uh, that's basically it. It essentially disassembles into three components, plus you can pull the spring off if needed. The barrel is pinned into the frame, so you don't remove it. Your hammer and everything, you don't really need to pull any of those pins out. And if you need to get to like the firing pin, that's easy to do with the way the safety is on these. You just rotate it up, pull it out. Your firing pin falls right out. Could not be simpler. I should point out this has an extractor right here, pretty standard. Yeah, it's a standard simple gun made of machined steel. Well, at least early on it was all machined steel. Later, there would be some changes in production. Minor, but noteworthy. In Soviet Russia, these were a little slow to get in the hands of soldiers, as I said. The first ones would be Special Forces, the Airborne, the VDB, and of course higher ranking officers. After that, tank crews and other vehicle crews would start to replace the Tokarevs or even Nagants with these. And then further down the ladder, NCOs, other lower ranking officers, and the police, the militia, would start to get Makarovs. And production would only be at Ishesk, but they ended up making a lot. How many? Well, estimates are about 5 million. That's a lot for one little pistol. And production was full scale through the 60s, 70s, and of course 80s with the Afghan war. And some sources claim that uh, these were replaced officially in Soviet-slash-Russian Federation service in 1991. This is incorrect. 
efforts to replace the Makarov PM in 1993 failed. Then in 2003, a replacement pistol, the MP4443 Grosh, was selected, but it was only ever bought in limited numbers, and frankly, while it had some advantages, like a more powerful cartridge, more a higher capacity, it had quality issues and reliability issues, so it never replaced it. In fact, this was still very much in the Ishmash catalog in 2002-2003. Finally, in 2019, a new replacement firing a new 9x21 armor-piercing cartridge is set to replace the venerable Makarov PM. But, as we've seen in 2022, during recent global events, there were a ton of these still in uh, Russian hands because they had so many, and they last. It's not like they wear out. These aren't alloy frames, and they're not being, you know, shot a whole bunch. Built to last. Overall, it's about six and a third inches long, tip to tip with the barrel just over 3.8 inches and it weighs roughly 26 ounces unloaded. For an all-steel gun, it's okay. It, you know, for the time it was made, the late 40s, it was fine. As early as 1955, efforts were made to both speed up production and reduce a little bit, a few grams. The frame was changed slightly to make it faster to machine. After experiences in uh, Russian hands and hands in other nations, plus, of course, the Afghanistan war, ultimately, some changes would be introduced. For example, an enlarged ejection port to have better reliability. Same thing on, like, 1911. Other changes were just because, for example, the star on this one is the small style star on the grip. Of course, grip colors could change. Red brown, black, just, you know, whatever material. These are a type of Bakelite or whatever, but they are steel reinforced. Actually quite durable grips for being a wraparound kind of U-piece shape. The screw is square, which is kind of cool. Of course, we've got the fixed lanyard loop here. They would also make some changes. This sight rib on top kind of varies in size a little bit from narrow to slightly wider. I've seen a few machining changes, little things like that, nothing major. Oh, and the, the safety. I've seen a few different patterns of safety on different Makarovs, so little things like that. And as time would go on, they would introduce some sheet steel or stamp steel components replacing the original machine components. Nothing that would hurt durability at all, but, you know, just let them ease up on production. It's a nicely blued pistol. And it does have a chrome lined barrel, which really explains why these have lasted so long. Now, as popular as the Makarov is, interestingly, it was only officially adopted by about a dozen nations, including North Korea and Vietnam. And it was only licensed produced in three other nations, with a fourth nation kind of making somewhat unlicensed copies. And for once, it wasn't China. East Germany, the DDR, if you will, was the first nation to technically build the Makarov outside of Russia. Known as the Pistol M, it would replace World War II era Lugers, P-38s, even PP and PPKs. They were being used by the military and police there in the 1950s. Production was set up at the Ernst Thalmann factory in Seoul, Germany, in 1958. But the first couple of years, 58, 59, it was kind of low rate and even experimental production. For example, they experimented with using some cast metal parts and other things to, you know, make it lighter and faster to build. But it, these things didn't work out. So by the time full rate production was going in 1960, it's almost an exact copy of the Russian pattern being made at the same time. These are known for a very high degree of fit and finish, and that seems to be true. Nice bluing. 
I notice on this one the frame is machined a little bit differently here as compared to being a little slimmer here on this Russian, but yeah. But the big noteworthy difference, the grips. The German grips mostly are black, sometimes with speckles of other colors in them, but mostly black. They lack the star and they lack the staple for the lanyard. I'm not actually sure why, because you can see some surplus guns where they kind of have a makeshift lanyard attached to the mag catch or other places. It seems like they probably could have used a lanyard staple, but oh well, they didn't. And they would mass produce these only until about 1965. And I don't know how many they were built in East Germany, but it was enough. And for a long time, these were very rare in the USA, but after the end of the Cold War, they were imported, and they're very respectable. Very few of them came in unissued. They all had mm, holster wear, but typically nice bores. This one has a particularly nice trigger. In fact, I passed up getting a one in nicer condition than this, because I like the trigger on this one better, and I have shot this one. But these would stay in East German service, including probably with the Stasi throughout the Cold War period, and some would still remain in service in a unified Germany through the 1990s before they could be replaced by more modern pistols. China was the next to build the Makarov, designating it as the Type 59 after the year of adoption. I find that a little interesting that they had really just adopted a version of the Tokarev, the Type 54, well, five years earlier, Although, to be fair, they also had the Type 51 Tokarev, so, yeah. And it, too, is pretty much an exact copy of Russian, except they did go to a somewhat easier-to-do type of salt blue. And these seem to show up with a few different factory codes. 56, 66, and 626 have been reported. And the first time Americans really encountered these was during the Vietnam War. And, yeah, China mass-produced these. Interestingly, not so much as a replacement for the Tokarev. They produced them concurrently, but for very different roles. As you can understand, they're very different pistols, so they used them both. In fact, you find a lot more information out there about the Chinese Type 54 than you do the Ch Type 59. It's kind of a little bit of an enigma. There are very few actual military ones in this country. Although some of the commercially sold ones were formerly military. The good news is they came in with unmolested sights. The bad news, they did have these thumb rests added to the left grip. But that was to comply with the 1968 Gun Control Act. And of course you can easily simply remove the grip and put on another one. I just have it on this one. Why? These were typically sold as either the Model 59 in America or the Norinco Sporting Pistol. This is especially the case for versions chambered in 9x17 380. But despite the Sporting Pistol name, yeah, it's a Chinese Makarov. This one's a little different safety shape here again from the others. I also notice it's got a bit of a hump here on the bottom of the trigger guard. The trigger guard seems just a little bit thicker. Quite a bit thicker, actually. Versus our Russian. Or even our East German. Yeah, much thicker trigger guard. I think that's just for efficiency of machining. Just a little faster. The trigger guards, and it's thicker, which is good for durability purposes. Let's see if it was a little bit larger for a trigger, but I don't think so. Just a heavier trigger guard. And it has the kind of thicker front to the frame. And it has the wide style top. And this has the large style star. Some claim that these are a little rougher than some of the others, and I can get that. The machining, yeah, it's fine. Mine seems to be a nicely made one, but with Chinese quality kind of being a little variable. I would completely believe that others aren't. 
Trigger is not as nice as the East German on mine, but it is a good shooter. And speaking of that, have been talking enough. So yeah, let's show a shooting clip of this here, Type 59. Chinese Type 59 Makarov. Those I'll talk more about reliability and shooting later on in the video once we kind of talk about everything, but yeah, these are all very reliable. Our fourth maker to talk about, and probably the one that's most famous in America, Bulgarian. Arsenal, originally Circle 10, now Arsenal AD began production under Russian supervision and control to some extent in 1975. And this would last for about a year, and by 1976, they would uh, kind of go, go their own way and start producing these entirely domestically, something that they would keep on doing even after the Cold War. They were building new pistols, or at least assembling them from parts, all the way through at least 2000, 2001, importing them under various names. They would have, of course, military-built guns, they would have police guns, and they would have commercial guns, several different finishes and styles. The Bulgarian Makarov is the quintessential Makarov. It's also probably the roughest, but that's not a bad thing. And for a long time, it was definitely the most affordable. It really is just a Russian Makarov copied in Bulgaria. Again, they started off making them under Russian supervision, so yeah, no wonder about that. These two usually come in with the thumb rest style grips, but typically in the box are a set of original military grips. It's perfectly legal to swap grips out because the, the point system from the Gun Control Act only applies for import, not ownership. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. It's worth pointing out that neither East Germany nor Bulgaria made the Tokarev, so these would replace other guns. And again, several other nations would use the Makarov, like Estonia and Latvia, without actually building them themselves. And on top of that, other nations would adopt the Simonin 9x18 cartridge, but go kind of for their own pistols to fire it. So with that, let's get into the guns that are called Makarovs and actually aren't. The first communist nation to adopt 9x18 as a cartridge, but decided to go its own way for the firearm, was Hungary. The FEG factory had a long history of producing firearms, including pistols, that dated back to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Some of their efforts are quite interesting, like the Frommer Stop, too. Following World War II, as many others, they started copying the Walther PPK as the M, or I should say, rather, the 48 a pistol. And at first it was Mostly a direct copy, but soon they would experiment with improved safeties and alloys and what have you. And these were for the police. For the military, they would start producing the Tokarev, known as the 48M. And it was an exact copy, except for the Hungarian crest. Throughout the 50s, it's kind of where things were. 56, of course, the Soviet Union invades Hungary, puts down an uprising. And then in 1958, Russia starts sharing the 9x18 technology. And at first, it was actually the Hungarian police that wanted a gun. And so they requested that FEG design something for the 9x18 cartridge. And the following year, the RK-59 was introduced. This is the SMC 918, which is the export version of that in some ways. We'll talk about it. But again, let's show a little shooting footage.
The original RK-59 was a PPK size gun, but chambered for the heavy hitting 9x18 cartridge, at least heavy hitting for a straight blowback, which this still of course is. It had about a 3.4 inch barrel and was quite compact at about a little over 6 inches long. It also had a short grip, a browning style mag release with a compact six round mag, kind of very Walther style again with the witness holes. Set you down here. And it has a Walther, sorry here, weird angles here guys. There we go. Has a Walther style safety, but reversed up again is fire. And it does have a firing pin block of sorts because the firing pin is tilted out of angle when yeah has the last round hold open as you see but no release catch like a walther so drop it so actually a lot closer in mechanical terms to the ppk or rather pp when it comes to the dual grip panels but the big deal it, they wanted lightweight so they had an alloy frame now the original rk-59 was just aluminium alloy but because of the potency of the cartridge this quickly developed stress fractures so it was replaced by the R61 and all FEG really had to do was add about 0.1% titanium to the alloy mix to make it strong enough and this was a success for the police and they continued to issue and use these interestingly the R61 is reported with both the short and long barrel. Now the slide of course is blued and originally these had smooth grip panels later the thumb rest grip would be introduced and these would uh, have either anodized black frames or left in the white. In fact because this was successful Around 1962, the Hungarian military decided that they would like a replacement for the Tokarev. Could FEG design them something? They wanted a seven round magazine and a hundred millimeter, so about 3.9 inches, nearly four inches barrel. Actually making this the longest barreled Tokarev. Excuse me, Makarov. I've been talking for a while already. <laughs> Thus, the next year, the PA-63 was first introduced. Let's show a little shooting footage of it. PA-63. This design was kind of considered a compromise for both military and police needs has the lightweight frame and this is left in the white both to save on time and energy and why not it does have the longer barrel it does have the extended grip with the seven round magazine so actually one less cartridge than in a Makarov same style of mag you can actually put the longer seven round mags in these uh, little, little shorties they just stick out a bit These are very light pistols. The PA-63 is about 21 ounces, so five ounces lighter than the PM. And the RK-59, R61, or an SMC-918 here, is 19 ounces. Of course, you definitely feel it. They do have a nicely curved back strap, though. And again, the firing pin does have a built-in safety, which is nice. We have a ring hammer. And these would be in pretty much standard production for military and police. There was that export version known as the AP series. And FEG would keep these in standard production up until 1990 with limited production for export up until about 2000. Now the uh, 
Military would continue using the PA-63, as would the police, after the Cold War. It was first replaced in limited numbers by the Israeli Jericho 941, and then in finally 1996 it was officially replaced by the FEG P9RC, which is a domestic pistol in 9mm. So it's out of military service today, but uh, the police still have some. The export versions would be not only chambered for 9x18, but also 380, 9x17, and 7.65 Browning, 32 Auto. In fact, you can find quite a few of the APs with the darkened frame, and some of these will even have steel frames for export. And again, smoother thumb rest grip. Kind of interesting, um, very comfortable to hold, frankly, with the curve and the grip and the finger rest, but because of the lightweight, very snappy, even for a Makarov, especially this little guy. I should point out that this version started being made for export into America in 1986, and they built fewer than 4,000, it seems like. And this is a kind of a famous point in history because it's the smallest pistol allowed for import under the 1968 Gun Control Act. These have a pretty good reputation, although kind of the quality is all over the place and with an alloy frame, people don't quite trust them as much. Plus it's a little more complex, more like a Walther PPK compared with the just absolute simplicity of a Makarov. So. Keep that in mind if you're looking at them. On the other hand, when these were coming in, they were the cheapest of all of these. So there's that. We now move to Poland and come to the, frankly, infamous Polish P-64. Manufactured by Circle 11, the Ogznik factory, today F.B. Bradham. This should be a great little pistol, and in some ways, it is. It was designed for a very specific purpose, which kind of explains its shortcomings, but we'll get there. Poland was building the Tokarev as the WZ-33, some sources say WZ-48, after the war. And that was their standard service gun. But in 1958, like everyone else, they were introduced to the 9x18 cartridge. And a team at the artillery research facility started working on a gun to fire it. This was a real big team, which actually led to the pistol's kind of informal name of Kazak, uh, C-Z-A-K, which were the initials of just the four lead designers. There were more. What they came up with were two offerings, the Pistol M and the Pistol W. The Pistol M was intended for police. It had a short barrel, six round mag, and fired 380, 9x17. The Pistol W also had a six round mag, but a longer barrel, heavier slide, and fired 9x18. And by 1960, 61, the testing phase was underway and the government decided, you know what, we like that pistol M. But, let's rechamber it for 9x18. So we put the more powerful cartridge in the little gun. Now they did make a few other changes from the prototype, for example, removing the external mag catch. Mm -hmm. As well as a few other product improvements. And this was adopted, at least nominally, to replace the Tokarev, but it's a compact little gun. It's the same size, essentially, as the RK-59, R-61. Now, since it's in a steel frame, it's a little heavier at about 22, 23 ounces. But you wouldn't think of that as a standard issue gun. Again, the R-61 was not. Well... Let's shoot this, I guess, and then we'll talk about why. Okay, well, I couldn't find a shooting clip of the P-64, 
four. But I found something that's approximately the same feel on the hands with about the same recoil and all that. So I'll show that. Also, see, I told you I was packed up and ready to go to the range. Ready? Yep. Here goes nothing. So why adopt such a small pistol for concealed carry? Well, because of this, the PM63 rack, as it's called. One of the earliest actual PDWs, a machine pistol. This was what was intended to be carried by tank crews, some airborne motorcycle groups, maybe some field officers, what have you. Also, they had plenty of Tokarevs, which could be carried by lower ranking officers in the field, like NCOs. So really, the P-64 was uh, really just for high ranking officers, police, security agents, anyone needing something truly compact. So even though on paper it replaced the Tokarev, in reality, it was a limited replacement there, leaving this to kind of fill that cross between a machine gun and pistol roll. And this thing is uh, actually pretty compact, frankly, for what it is, including having a deployable little stock and uh, able to use 15 or 25 round mags. So th this is kind of the reason why frankly. The uh, P-64 is the way it is. Context really is king. But just for fun, let's show a shooting clip or two of this gun. PM-63, last mag of the day. Oh, my finger's getting tired. And that was with Wolf. Sweet. Feature-wise, there are a few interesting things going on with the P-64 here. It's just, it is a high-quality produced gun, nice bluing, a lot of machining, two-piece wraparound grips, six-round mag. We do have a last-round hold open, but no release. Relatively easy to cock, if I'm being honest. The safety is quite cool. It decocks, but it also totally disengages the trigger. And you can still rack the system with it on, something the Makarov cannot do. Now, the single action pull is fine. Almost nice, frankly. What about that famous double action? about 25 maybe even more pounds why is that well yet again because of the PM 63 rack this was an open bolt machine gun and so to make sure there wouldn't be accidents it had very hard primers for its 9 by 18 ammunition they wanted to be able to use the same ammo in the P64, therefore, the firing pin had to hit with a lot of authority. On a single action pull, you're already compressing that spring. But on a double, you're having to get all that tension behind it. So that's why compatibility. So this was kind of, you know, the, the design was perfected as much as it would be. In 1964, it was classified as the WZP-64, or just WZ-64-P-64. And it would be put into limited production and be adopted in 1965. Full production would run from about 1966 through 1977. And there would be some changes. Early on, around 1970-71, they would make a minor modification internally to the hammer system to improve safety. 
in uh, 73, they would actually go to a large spur hammer and they would modify the trigger system again a bit for safety. These would be the major, uh, major changes. Because by this point they were already hoping to replace it, but it would take a little time. And in fact, even though on paper this has been replaced a long time ago, the Polish military still shows a number of P-64s in uh, warehouses and inventory, what have you. Well-made guns and probably great if you're a police officer, a high-ranking officer that never has to shoot it, but snappy as all hell, which explains why the replacement was desperately wanted and needed. The P-83 Wanad. Work began on this pistol around 1975, and by 1978 we had a couple of early versions, advanced prototypes known as the P-78A first, and then the P-78B, and that would be what was developed into uh, this pistol. It's basically just to address all the shortcomings of the P-64. Yes, size, magazine capacity, heavy recoil, heavy trigger, not the best uh, controls, but also production. The P-64 was actually very time consuming and pretty expensive to, to build. It required a lot of polishing, fitting, machining. Now nah, we gotta get rid of that. Also, you know, it's time to retire the Tokarev for real and the PM-63 had its own drawbacks and shortcomings. So one pistol to replace them all. And after further development at the Research Institute, production was transferred to the Uxnik factory, Circle 11. It was formally adopted for military and police use as the WZ P83 in 1984 and very soon thereafter put into mass production, which would last for quite some time. And uh, it would be, frankly, a lot more successful in all ways than its predecessor. And if it looks a lot like a Makarov PM, you're not wrong, but it does have a lot of differences and is not parts interchangeable. But first, let's take this one and shoot it. P83. <laughs> First ways it improves upon the 64. Really, it doesn't have that much longer of a barrel. Probably less than you'd think, but we're going from about three and a quarter inches to a little over three and a half. We do, of course, have a longer grip though, and all the controls have been enlarged a, a great deal. The mag catch down here is easy to hit. We have an eight round mag now instead of six. We have a very large hammer, which is kind of a take on from the late P64 type hammer. We've got a larger safety. This uses an improved version of the firing pin system. It actually moves the firing pin out of the way when you cock it. Mine's a little finicky sometimes, but come on you. There we go. I need to fix that. It's got a little catch in it there. Anywho. And we have a slide release here for the first time. They've decided maybe taking that out with the 64 wasn't the best idea. And we've got a much larger top strap with larger sides. They're still quite small, but more usable. And the double action trigger is far from horrendous, and the single action is downright nice, and the trigger is ribbed for your pleasure too. This is about a 9 to 12 pound pull, perfectly reasonable, so half of what the 64 had. To address manufacturing concerns, they went to a more modern and simple bluing process. They also went to a more modern polymer grip 
They also gave it a language ring, unlike the 64 here. But quite interestingly, taking a lesson from the AKM, this is made from a lot of stampings with uh, spot welds to hold it together. The slide is stamped. The trigger is mostly made from a type of stamping. The release for the slide is a stamping. Yeah, it's just kind of interesting. Even the magazine has a lot of stamped or sheet steel components. Trigger guard. Yeah. So even though it was made to be cheaper and easier to produce, it doesn't feel chintzy. It probably doesn't look as elegant, but it's sure a lot more pleasant to shoot. Now, like I said, this might look like a pretty standard Makarov with a bit of a big hammer, but um, they are not parts interchangeable. For example, here are the magazines. They probably look quite similar, but not interchangeable. The Polish mag is a little bigger and it's got a very squared off edge to everything. It's also more drop free. Like if you hit this, it, it pops out with a lot more authority if that makes sense. Size and weight wise are about the same. The 83 is about 25 to 26 ounces. So same as a Makarov, maybe slightly lighter. It has a slightly shorter barrel, but that's because there's more back here because of the safety system. This is a little bit narrower, but overall length is essentially the same. One thing I really like that they did that's a neat feature is the takedown method. As we said at the beginning and showed this, you know, you pull the trigger down, trigger guard down, Walther style. This actually has a neat little latch. You just pull it down spring loaded so it's not going to get it's not going to drop on you it's very sir, uh, firm pull it back and up and off makes disassembly a little easier but what really helps is uh, with reassembly you don't have to mess around with uh, trying to do a trigger guard that's it pretty neat I mean, they shoot out with pretty good authority versus a Makarov. Where they don't. <laughs> um, it's a little blockier. Again, not as elegant looking and probably not as durable because of stamped steel versus machined. But it served the Polish military and police very well long after the Cold War. In fact, we didn't even start to see these surplus in America until 2009 because they kept them around for a very long time. There have been a few replacements like the VIS 94 and now this 100, but it wasn't until recent years that most of them were handed in. Neat gun, but we have one more country to get to. As we approach the end, we come to what I think we can all can agree is the most modern, most advanced 9x18, at least available in America. The Czechoslovakian CZ made VZ82. Technically, I guess this does predate the P83 slightly, but I'm going to call it the final design really because this is an all-new design. Czechoslovakia had never built a 9x18 before. Whereas the P83 was a refinement of existing guns that Poland had made. Well, why did Czechoslovakia wait till the 80s, nearly the end of the communist era, to build a Makarov gun? As before, context is everything. But first, range footage of this gun. VZ... 82. Czechoslovakia really from the beginning was a bit of an uneasy communist ally. They really did not want to adopt Soviet stuff. They wanted they had their own very successful 
small arms industry. In fact, in 1968, Russia had to step in and yada yada. It seems to be a referring trend with Russia, come to think of it. So when they were forced to go to 7.62 Tokarev, they made the VZ-52, which originally was meant to be a 9mm pistol. They also had built the VZ-50 and the upgraded VZ-70 here, firing 7.65 Browning. Now the VZ-52 was not terribly successful. It had a lot of shortcomings, but unfortunately it had to stay in service because they just they had to. They didn't have the money, the time, the energy to replace it. A lot of police and higher ranking officers though carried a VZ-50 or VZ-75. But in the 70s, CZ got into more of the commercial game with the CZ-75. Of course this is my modern B variant, but it was to hand, so yeah. This became an international success for CZ, except it wasn't because of patent laws and all that and the communist bloc. Everyone could copy the CZ-75 and many did. So it didn't really earn CZ a lot of money. But it did show them just the whole modern take. And by this point, the VZ-52 really had to be replaced. And the 50 and 70 were definitely aging out. And that's how we end up with the VZ-82. But again, as before, they definitely weren't going to adopt just a Makarov copy. And they weren't even going to adopt the Russian loading for 9x18. Rather, Settler and Bellot made their own projectile that had a slightly lighter bullet, higher velocities. They said it was about 20% uh, more effective, had about a 100 meter per second higher velocity out of the muzzle. Just a hotter little round. So with that developed around 1981-1982, work began at CZ on what would become the VZ-82, which was accepted for military service and put into full production as the, in 1983. It was also built for commercial and export sales as the CZ-83, not just chambered for 9x18, but also chambered for 380 and uh, 32, uh, 7.65, which is actually pretty cool. But um, feature-wise, you can see a resemblance to the 75, frankly. The 75 had a double stack magazine, single feet at the top. A very new concept for that day and time. Although, of course, it dates back to the high power, so not really new. I guess what's old is new again in some ways. And that was carried over to the 82 with a very similar style of... Uh, magazine tube holding 12 rounds of Makarov. There's actually two variants of this mag. One has a thick machined base plate, another one has a thinner stamped base plate. But very clearly that. The mag catch from the 75 is in the same location, but it's ambidextrous on the 82. as is the safety here. Now this has a single-sided safety on the 75, but on the 82 here, it's uh, double-sided. Now you can't engage it with the hammer down. Cocking it back though, it's an easy flick up. Not a decocker. One of the few that does not have a decocker actually. And this was the first military pistol to be adopted in the world with those ambidextrous features. The only feature it doesn't have that's not ambi is the slide release. It does have one, thankfully, but not on this side. Other interesting features. It has polygonal rifling in the chrome line bore, made famous by Glock in the 80s. It has larger sights than other Makarovs. They're still not huge by today's standards, but larger. Again, very much taken from the 75, at least in principle. Very nice wide trigger in both modes. Good spur. And the takedown is kind of like the P83 in that you just click 
down and hold it down. It's held on on its own, but it's the full trigger guard. So it's kind of a combination of the two. And once something that's kind of neat with the mag in, you cannot pull that down. This has a slightly shorter barrel than the PA-63, but slightly longer than the Makarov. And you would think with all the extra features, it'd weigh a, a, quite a bit more, but it really doesn't. It's only about 28 ounces unloaded. Of course, with 12 full cartridges in, it would be more. And this is all on top of supposedly firing a hotter round from cellar and bellet. And pretty ergonomic grips, too. It is quite an effectively modern gun. And it served the Czechoslovakian and later Czech and Slovakian when they broke apart militaries well for a long time. Standard production for the military version would run from 83 till 92. And production of civilian and commercial variants would run all the way up, at least in limited batches, to 2012. And this would stay in military service throughout the 1990s, only being replaced in the early 21st century, although some police would still continue to use it, because it is quite a modern gun all things considered the cellar and bellet 9 by 18 is still not as punchy and potent as 9 millimeter nato but it is definitely exceeding anything 380 9 millimeter curves can do and while this isn't quite as simple and reliable and all that as a standard makarov it's still very well designed it shows they learned a lot of lessons between the 50s and the 80s when they made this. And a fun fact, kind of a footnote, here in 2022, the Czech Republic donated 30,000 VZ-82s to Ukraine. Yeah. And with that, we have one more pistol. And we will kind of end where we began, as we should, with the Makarov in Russia. You have to wonder if the Russians were a little jealous of the VZ-82, because in 1990, work began in the PMM modernized Makarov pistol first appeared. Although its life and production would be a little hit and miss. Now this is not a true PMM. There are very few if any in America. This is an IJ 7018H. But oh well. Good enough. At least I have the right grips on it. And she shoots quite well. Well, regardless if the engineers at Izhesk, soon to be Izhmash, would credit those at CZ, the war in Afghanistan kind of changed things in the 1980s. The Makarov was built to be a self-defense gun during a time when body armor did not exist and during a time when combat was, was different. But the events of the Afghan war really showed that a higher capacity and better penetration would be really advantageous. And so, just as CZ did, that's exactly what the PMM tried to go for. As a 12 round magazine, or 10, so higher capacity. But the main thing was it was built to fire a new cartridge, 7 and 16. This was an 85 grain bullet with, which is a little lighter, with a more of a powder charge behind it, that Russia claimed to be 25% higher velocity, more punch, than the standard 93 grain. Hard to say because it never really went anywhere. What they did, they would give the chamber some kind of spiral fluting to try to give it a bit of a delay blowback action, at least effectively, mechanically, with the cartridge. This would be tested out, and the cartridge would be made, but it never was adopted by the Russian 
government, military, police. So they really kind of dropped the whole notion. In 1993, they did start looking at replacements for Makarovs, and really nothing was selected, but this was Izhmasha's submission in 1994, and they would put these into full production. And they would actually be bought in numbers by the Russian government. They would be given to the Federal Guards, they would be given to the Ministry of the Interior, and they would be given to select units in the military. Spetsnaz were amongst the earliest to get these, although again, they were issued with the standard 93 grain, not the 85 bullets. <clears throat> and later on, the Airborne, the VDV, would kind of prefer these a few others would get them too, so they would, they would get out there because it was better than nothing until new pistols came along. And it does have some important updates, although relatively minor for being honest. Now to make these legal for import into the USA, again that 1968, what Ishesk, importing under the IMS name, sometimes also the Bakel name, they put in an adjustable rear sight, unfortunately. So that's not part of the military design. But everything else is pretty straight on these. The slide is more or less the same as a normal Makarov. Again, the spiral cut chamber was dropped. And the big deal, of course, was the magazine. Having the same type of release, we have a kind of a unique mag that is a, a double stack but single feed conversion and this was done to keep the same pattern as on the normal Makarov. That way things could be kept the same. And there's a few different styles of these mags. Even in the military some were 10, some were 12. With the larger mag we have a wider grip, but that's not a bad thing. First, they added some checkering to the front. It's also just a little more ergonomic. We have kind of effective thumb rests here. They do make it a little more comfortable, and they're ambidextrous too. And we still have a lanyard loop, but it's moved to the uh, base of the grip now. So it is a little bit more of an ergonomic grip, and the idea was that that gives better accuracy, and I would agree. And since it has that tapered magazine, it's very skinny at the top, but then it flares out at the bottom. Minor improvement, but an improvement, and that was hoped to improve accuracy and what have you. Again, trying to address some issues observed in Afghanistan. And these would see some use in places like Chechnya, and Georgia, and it would not surprise me at all if a few PMMs were over in Ukraine right now. Even though, officially, a couple years ago, this was replaced by the Yudav pistol firing 9 by 21 when we see pictures from over there, it's mostly Makarov PMs that are turning up. They also have some Glocks in Russian service today, too, for what that's worth. But, had to mention it, as you know, it's kind of one of my favorite guns, even though it's a commercial version, it's just so kind of weird. And it, too, works very reliably. And with that, let's end by kind of talking about how these shoot. Well, the five essentially basic same Makarovs, roughly speaking, all shoot the same. For my examples, the Russian and the East German are probably the smoothest, the East German being the best. The Chinese is just a hair behind. The Bulgarian's the roughest, but it's not, not bad at all. And the commercial Russian is fine. Their larger grip's nice. One thing I forgot to mention a second ago, this does have a stamped slide release instead of the earlier style. So they're all pretty equally reliable. Some people find them a little snappy, a little punchy. I, I don't, but I can understand it. I just, I like the fact that you know when you pull the trigger, it's gonna go bang. And it's not a little 22 or something. It 
for what it is for close range, 20, 25 meters, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put some hurt on. And that's the whole point of this gun. And it's just one of those guns you can put somewhere and not worry about. Maintenance is very light and trouble free. I just, I don't know. I just enjoy shooting them. I always have. Chinese Type 59 Makarov. First trigger pull. Single action's nice. That's not what I can say about the SMC 918 or the P64. I don't. The SMC, it's, it's ergonomic enough in the hand, but it's so light, 19 ounces, it's very snappy. But if you just want to want a mag or two, that's okay. I just wouldn't want to shoot it all day. The P64, I do not really care for the ergonomics. Something about the way this trigger works, it pinches my finger a bit. And sometimes my hand rides up a little high on this grip and can get snapped by the slide. Also, the back of the grip's kind of a little bit rough in the molding of the grip plastic. It's just, it's not fun. And I don't know anyone who thinks these are, which is a shame because it's a very well-made and cool looking gun. It definitely is classed as one of those guns that I'm super happy to own. And I'll shoot about once a year to remind myself why I shoot it only once a year. Although the big brothers, eh, that's a different story. I really like shooting the PA-63. In fact, I had mine out a couple of trips ago with uh, Doc because he likes Macrogs too, because he's right-minded and like his son, who hates them. It's, it has an ergonomic grip, full size, quite a long snout, and at 21 ounces, it's still very light. It's a little snappy, but in kind of the fun way. Again, not something I'd probably want to shoot all afternoon, but I could do four or five mags through it comfortably. So it's in between. Now the P83 from Poland, I really like this one. Nice trigger, big hammer. This is really comfy. I, I, I like everything about it. And it has kind of a modern aesthetic to it. Look at the grip, you know, that matte texture on the grips. It helps maybe the fact that I won one of these for so long and it was kind of the last major version to come in to be imported. So it was really cool when they finally came in. And when they did, these tended to be in really, really good shape too. But, yeah, I, I, if you want a shooter of these four, P83, hands down. Of course, it's really difficult not to recommend to anyone who's wanting a 9x18 gun not to get a VZ82. These did not come in before 2005 because they didn't have 10-round mags. They were all 12. And before the sunset of the assault weapons ban, that was evil. But as soon as the band came off, these started to come in. When they first came in, they were about $300, which seemed like a lot when you could get other Macrobs for $100, $150. But it has a lot of cool features. But things got better. In 2007, the ATF decided these were classed Curio and Relic, meaning you could order one on an FFL-03, a collector of Curio and Relic's license. This was done because the nation of Czechoslovakia no longer exists, and that's um, one qualification to be CNR. That also applies to military Russian Makarovs, not the commercial ones, because those were imported in 94, 95 period when, within the Russian Federation. It would not apply to Bulgarian or Chinese, because those nations still exist, but it does apply to East German guns, because that doesn't exist. I guess I should mention that there was a batch brought over from Germany around 1995 produced by Simson, still in Seoul. They used mostly original parts, but some new parts to make German production Makarov PMs. These are the fifth maker, fourth country outside of Russia, who was technically not licensed to build these. And they're just like regular guns, except they didn't modify the hammer. So like on the Polish gun, you can charge the slide with the safety on. Otherwise, they're the same. They're also pretty collectible. 
I should point out that when it comes to Bulgarian, there are several types for different importers, even Arsenal branded ones. Yeah, there's a wide range there, but none of those are CNR yet. Now, starting in a few years, the earliest military ones will become CNR, but not quite yet. And, uh, of course, as far as the Hungarian guns, if they're old enough and you can prove it, they're CNR. Same goes for the Polish. The P-64s are generally accepted to be a CNR now. The majority, anyway. P-83s are not. And, again, yeah, the 82s are. These are just cool guns. Um, comfortable, reliable. A lot of people refinished these and made them into project guns because after they were declared CNR, the price actually dropped. It got down to about as low as $200. And the magazines were pretty readily available for 10, 20 bucks. So you could afford to buy multiple mags and a couple of guns. And generally they were in really good shape. The only thing I would say, a lot of people bought Makarovs to use as carry guns. I don't recommend that. For one, today Makarovs are a little too pricey collectible wise. For another, these are surplus guns with unknown histories. You know, you saw my uh, P83, which is in good shape, but you saw how this, the safety was acting a little janky there. That's something I need to get in there and fix. I can turn it on fine with the hammer down, but when it's back, helps if I do it right, huh, guys? That reverse uh, safety. Yeah, see, I can usually force it. Although it's going to be a jerk there, yeah. I just need to work on it. Some, uh, something's walked out on her. It happened during the last range trip. That's the point, though. These are surplus guns. We don't know how they were treated. We don't know what some moron might have done to them. It's just not what you want in a gun that may protect your life or the lives of your loved ones. Plus, today, there are so many great little carry options. There's just no reason. Now, these have definitely crossed over into the cool collectible camp. And cool shootable camp too, because you can still get 9x18 ammo. Uh, typically, loadings in America are 95 grain, which is fine. There are some hollow point loadings too, and generally, most of these guns will feed hollow points okay. Kind of the benefit of a blowback gun. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed this next Trek video, long one. <laughs> Sorry again, couldn't go shooting. I was exceedingly disappointed, um, but. We'll get out as soon as we can to do that. This, like I said at the beginning, I was hoping to make kind of my ultimate macro video, sharing with you all my little tidbits and stuff I've learned over the years. Not getting too deep into the nitty gritty details, but wanting to be thorough. I did even consider bringing out holsters, but this is already plenty long. We didn't need another 20 minutes of looking at old cow high, did we? Or in the case of Hungarian, pig hide. <laughs> Maybe next time. But uh, let me know what you think. Years ago when I was young and getting into guns, these were kind of all the rage because college students could afford them. And you had a lot of options. But you can still find them today. I still get emails on Bulgarian guns. And even at modern prices, for what you get, it's a great gun. All steel, gonna last a very long time, easy to find mags for, easy to accessorize. It's a really cool part of history, and that's, that's a lot of the allure. But it's also a part of history that I have no problem shooting. I'm not worried about breaking parts on a Makarov or any of the, you know, foreign derivatives thereof. But, just wanted to revisit this. It's been a little while since we've taught Makarovs. And it's kind of my happy place. It always puts me in a better mood and feel better. So hope it did the same for you. As always, if you could, please do like, share, and subscribe. And as always, if you'd like to help support the channel, please check on the link to the Patreon page. This is Misha, and hopefully next time I'll be from the range. Catch you then.